Okay, lecture five, variational quantum eigensolver. Let's start with motivation. Previously, before variational quantum eigensolver, there was a method, uh, quantum phase estimation, uh, which, was, which is depicted here. Uh, you don't need to know much about this method, uh, only that uh, it accepted as a input some approximate uh, quantum state of the uh, system that you want to investigate and get the energy, for example. And as an output, it gives out the energy uh, corresponding to the eigenstate of the, of the system. So essentially, it takes the approximate wave function and gets the exact energy, which is really great. Uh, so the two problems with this approach uh, were that you need to provide pretty accurate uh, approximate wave function. Otherwise, there is a chance of getting kind of a wrong energy estimate. But even bigger problem was that uh, even though we knew what kind of unitary transformation needs to go into the scheme, uh, and that unitary transformation was like exponent of the Hamiltonian, the problem was that uh, quantum computers cannot implement the exponent of Hamiltonian as one gate uh, for interesting systems. Uh, and uh, you need to break this uh, unitary transformation into a product of elementary gates. And uh, a sequence of those gates becomes uh, just too long to implement on any uh, currently available computers. And uh, that was the main problem. Uh, in order to address actually two of those problems, uh, variational quantum eigensolver was suggested. Uh, and it was uh, essentially trying to optimize the unitary transformation directly so that the energy uh, will be minimized okay instead of essentially like in qp uh, setting up a particular unitary transformation and then breaking it down to gates uh, what in variational quantum eigensolver is done is uh, the unitary synthesized out of, uh, of gates to minimize energy now the main source on this topic uh, could be original paper in 2014, uh, variational quantum eigensolver, or since 2014, there are a lot of uh, work has been done and uh, there are these two nice review papers uh, written quite recently on all the developments. And of course, they introduce variational quantum eigensolvers and all uh, associated uh, developments and uh, you can learn from those reviews or original paper. All right, now, how does the variational quantum eigensolver work? It's a hybrid algorithm where the minimization of energy is split in two parts. First part is done on a quantum computer and second part is done on a classical computer. So what quantum computer is doing, it sets up the quantum wave function. How does it do it? It starts with some uh, qubits, in some vacuum state, and then rotates the qubits, entangles them, essentially obtains the some trial wave function, and then measures the Hamiltonian expectation value on this wave function. Uh, the result of the expectation value uh, is passed to the classical computer, uh, which takes it and uh, tries to essentially come up with the new angles of the unitary rotations, so that uh, on the next iteration, uh, we could lower the expectation value even more. So uh, what essentially classical algorithm, classical part gives to the quantum one is a new trial wave function uh, that the quantum computer needs to implement and obtain the expectation value. And this uh, cycle repeats and eventually uh, the idea is that the classic computer, classical part of the algorithm will converge to uh, some value that will be the lowest and uh, that's the, the end of the algorithm. That's uh, the expectation value of uh, Hamiltonian, which is corresponding to uh, ground state, say. Now, there are three main challenges in this scheme. The first is that the unitary transformation is not so easy to find because it lives in the exponentially large space of all possible unitary transformations. 
Uh, the second problem is that uh, Hamiltonian uh, cannot be measured at once. Uh, so you, as we will discuss later, need to partition the Hamiltonian into pieces uh, that uh, you need to measure separately. The third problem is that the uh, Hamiltonian space, or Hilbert space of qubit Hamiltonian essentially, is equivalent to entire Fock space of original problem. And uh, that Fock space contains uh, various uh, electronic states, uh, various number of electrons, uh, various spins. So it's a large space and uh, looking for a particular electronic state in that large space may be challenging. So uh, in the next two lectures, I will discuss uh, challenges one and two, but in this lecture, I want to illustrate challenge number three. Also, I would like to show the early days kind of uh, implementation of the variational quantum eigen solver and actual hardware, which was done by the uh, IBM group in 2017. So there are these three molecules, hydrogen, lithium H, and helium H2. And if we zoom into the lithium H case, so they all more or less similar. Uh, we have a potential energy surface, right? So electronic energy as a function of the interatomic distance, right? And dash dot curves is a classical simulation of the exact result within the uh, fixed basis. The basis was relatively small, like ST3G in this case. And uh, then these uh, black dots correspond to the actual uh, calculations done on the actual hardware, while this fuzzy curve is a classical simulation of what is supposed to be a uh, result of the quantum hardware. So, as you can see, there is a some strange kink-like structure on the potential energy surface uh, in lithium H, it's the, the most visible. In the hydrogen, it's uh, somewhat less visible, but still there. So the claim in the paper that uh, there was not enough correlation included on top of the mean field result. And uh, when I looked and my group looked at, the, at this result, we were somewhat puzzled because uh, it seems like uh, uh, this region is somewhat special. It's almost like there are, multi there are multiple states and uh, one of them was the ground state somewhere in this region, and then there was a switch of the solution to the, to the next, <clears throat> maybe of the different symmetry. So we suspected that it's a, it's a result of the symmetry breaking rather than uh, absence of uh, or a lack of uh, correlation, even though one can, like, uh, those two things can be connected. But essentially, we would like uh, we wanted to investigate this a little bit further, uh, whether to confirm that there is a symmetry breaking and uh, maybe find a way how to uh, improve uh, this situation. And uh, there is very natural thought: if it's a symmetry breaking, then you can probably try to constrain uh, your variational quantum eigensolver by putting uh, extra penalty for breaking the symmetry. For that you need to create the functional where on top of the energy that was used before, you also add some symmetry constraint where mu is, uh, you can put several symmetries, like say number or uh, spin, uh, electron spin for uh, constraining, say for singlet or triplet state, right? So uh, you can have a set of constraints and mu is just generally a large number that uh, introduces penalty for the expectation value for your function to deviate from the expectation uh, of a symmetry operator that you want to impose. Now, this construction almost uh, contain no overhead uh, compared to the what is already there because all these uh, ex new expectation values in the qubit space, they contain the same matrix elements uh, more or the same operator fragments as already present in the Hamiltonian. So that was easy to add. Uh, also uh, monitoring the, in, when, when we do measurement, monitoring what number of uh, say electrons uh, every uh, measurement gives us, uh, we could uh, reduce some noise in the uh, 
the hardware uh, that was associated with uh, some kind of depolarization errors and other uh, random flips. So that was useful uh, to have this constraint even to uh, kind of uh, purify the results a little bit more. And also from practical perspective that the uh, square of constraint operator uh, is enough for the imposing the symmetry, even though in order to impose the symmetry exactly, you need the variance of the, expect of the you know, symmetry operator. But putting just expectation value was already enough to uh, get the right symmetry. Now, how does this all work? Uh, we tried first hydrogen molecule uh, on the irrigating machine because that's the simpler than lithium H. And we did this in a mean field level. Now, there are three states in the hydrogen uh, molecule that we considered. Uh, two neutral states, singlet, the blue curves, uh, they, all the, all the so kind of, uh, all the uh, smooth curves are generated on the classical computer simulating what quantum computer is supposed to get. All the dots correspond to the actual hardware simulations. So we have three states, uh, singlet, all the, all the blue data, uh, triplet, again, neutral, all the, all the red stuff and the orange curve and dots uh, H2 plus, that's a cation. Now, when we consider a singlet state, uh, the, the exact answer is this uh, solid curve and the mean field level doesn't provide the you know, exact result uh, because it's approximate. So that's uh, it's a dashed curve. Now in the quantum hardware, we simulated the mean field result so that's uh, that's why the, the dots are supposed to follow the, the dash curve. Now for the other two states, the H2 plus and triplet, uh, the mean field turns out to be exact uh, for this uh, small basis that we used. That's why there are no dash and solid curves, they're just on a solid curve. But now the, the important thing is that if you follow the, the dashed uh, solid curve, and see that uh, it intersects with the solid red curve that exactly shows the origin of possible kink. If you don't really impose any constraints, uh, then the ground state in this area would be in the mean field, uh, the singlet state. And somewhere here, the singlet becomes higher in energy and the triplet uh, turns into the ground state. Now, Ironically, H2 plus is one of the simplest uh, well, states uh, to generate. The mean field is exact, this is only one electron, but because it's a higher in energy uh, compared to the neutral states, uh, you can actually not even get that state unless you impose the constraints. So that was the, the main uh, kind of revelation that uh, indeed the symmetries are important to, to impose to avoid any kink structure uh, so that the states don't switch in the areas where the kind of the potential energy surface may cross. And then after finishing with the H2, we uh, moved on to the lithium H and uh, so want to confirm that indeed kink there originated from the uh, change of the symmetry. So we generated again the blue curve that corresponds to ground state, uh, green curve uh, with the qubit mean field results. And for the qubit mean field results, also classical computer uh, simulations, uh, we also looked at the, not only energies, but the spin of the system as a, as a function of the nuclear geometry. And we saw that when the kink happens in the mean field theory, uh, completely in parallel with the IBM results, uh, we have a uh, spin jumping from the singlet state here to the triplet state because uh, the triplet state has an eigenvalue of S squared 2 and the singlet is 0. So that's what happens here. Kink is uh, going along with the essentially change of the spin and the switching between the two states. With that, I would like to summarize that variational quantum magnet solver was suggested to address two problems of uh, quantum phase estimation. It's initial wave function preparation 
and also long circuits for uh, unitary transformation needed in the quantum phase estimation. But uh, variational quantum eigensolver introduces uh, three uh, new problems. Uh, first is how to find the right state in the qubit space, which is essentially equivalent to the Fox space of the original problem. Two, how to parameterize the unitary transformation and how to measure Hamiltonian efficiently. So adding physical constraint helps to navigate the qubit space and to solve problem uh, number one in these three. But finding efficient unitary ansatz and uh, measurement uh, schemes for variational quantum eigen solver are the most pressing, pressing issues uh, right now. And so they will be addressed in the next two lectures. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, leave you with these uh, three questions for further discussion.